Demosthenes was an orator in Athens in the 4th century BC. He rose to become the head of the Athenian people because he was a great speaker. Athens had what they considered a perfect democracy. It was one of the first democracies on record in world history. If you were an Athenian citizen, and there were six or 7,000 of them, and they were all white, male, and they had property. So if you didn't have property, or if you were a woman, or if you were a slave, no, you were not a citizen. But if you were a citizen, all citizens had the right to come to the assembly and to express themselves on the issues of the day. There weren't any deputies or anything getting in the way. No, well, okay, we all talked, now we vote. So you can see how if you could walk into that assembly, make a speech, and get most people to agree with you, well, then you ran the government, right? The government did what the assembly decided. And that's how Demosthenes became the head of the Athenian people. His speeches were copied down because he was smart. He knew the literary age was coming. He had all of his speeches written down. There are 62 of them. And these were considered as models of perfection in public speaking all through the ancient period. From the time he was alive to the time of ancient Rome, if you ask Cicero, the greatest Roman speaker, who was the greatest speaker of all time, he'd say, well, that was Demosthenes. If you asked a teacher of rhetoric in Constantinople in 800 AD, who was the greatest speaker of all time, he'd say, well, that was Demosthenes. One of Demosthenes' speeches called On the Crown was considered the perfect speech. You could not write a better speech than that. It was perfect. A young man came to Demosthenes. When Demosthenes was an elderly man, he was famous, he was renowned for being a great speaker, and he asked him this one simple question. The question was this, Master, can you tell me what is the first part of oratory? What's the most important thing to do for an effective presentation? Demosthenes answered him with one word. What do you think that word was? Smile is a part of what Demosthenes said, but it's not the word he used. Anyone else? What's the most important to you when you're doing a presentation? Preparation. Preparation is important too. And that's not what Demosthenes said, although he did prepare for his presentation. Practiced in front of a mirror, among other things. Anything else? You, young man, when you're doing a presentation, what's, the, what's most important to you? What's the one thing you've got to make sure you get done? Make sure the message gets through. But that's not what Demosthenes said. Demosthenes responded with one word. I think I have the word here for you. Let me see if I can put it up. There. Hypocrisis. <laughs> Here's the Latin transcription of it. Hypocrisis. The young man was not satisfied with this answer. I'm not going to tell you what it means yet. But the young man came back and he asked Demosthenes, well then, Master, what is the second part of oratory? Once we get past this hypocrisis thing, which I don't really understand, tell me, what's the second thing? Demosthenes answered him again with one word. What do you think that one word was? Anybody guess? Yeah. The truth doesn't change just because some kid doesn't like it. <laughs> and hypocrisis is not only the most important thing, it's also the next most important thing. The young man came back a third time and asked Demosthenes again. He was persistent. I give him credit. He said, well then, Master, what is the third part of oratory? Again, Demosthenes answered him with only one word. And now, even though you don't know what that word was, I'll bet you all know I mean, what it means. I'll bet you all know what the word was. What was the word? Let me hear it. Hypocrisis. Let me hear everybody say it. Hypocrisis. There, you all know now what is the secret. The one secret, first, second, third. You could have asked Demosthenes 20 times, what's the 20th most important thing? He would have said, that's hypocrisis too. Now stop, go learn hypocrisis. Come back to me when you're done, at the end of your life. It's just it. That's how important hypocrisis is. That's the secret that came out of this earlier period of live culture. This is what they learned over hundreds of years when there was no literature. 
when the only way to communicate effectively is this way, as we're doing right now, here and now. And as we can do in our age, you could put a bunch of people on, at Stanford University on the other end of that camera and the cable. You could put people at five different universities in different places and hook them in simultaneously. They could all get this. Live. Now. You see Aristotle here. I regard Aristotle as the beginner of this literary age. But on this one issue, Aristotle agrees with Demosthenes. Now, Aristotle had a history a little different from Demosthenes. Aristotle was never a great speaker, never became famous for his speaking talent. He was a scientist. In his youth, he studied marine biology. He was a student at Plato's Academy. And after he had finished his, his training, he became the tutor of Alexander the Great who then went on to try to take over the world. After Aristotle had tutored Alexander the Great, he then came back down to Athens and opened up his own school in Athens where he taught young men. So on one side of town you had Aristotle teaching philosophically, and on the other side of town you had Demosthenes delivering speeches and running the government by virtue of his power. At a certain point in time, Aristotle decided to write a treatise or give some lectures on the subject of oratory. And we have those today. It's called Aristotle's Rhetoric. It's in three volumes, although many classical scholars believe that the second volume really wasn't a part of it. <laughs> Shouldn't even be in there. But anyway, let's just take it that it's in there. In the beginning of the third volume of Aristotle's Rhetoric, and mind you, Aristotle's rhetoric then became the foundation for all of the literary treatments of the discipline, the intellectual study of rhetoric ever since then. To this day, the schoolmasters across Sweden, across Europe, in the United States, they revere Aristotle's name and Aristotle's rhetoric, and they think they follow it. Although many of them don't know a word of Greek, and if you showed them this word, hypocrisis, they wouldn't know what it means any more than you do. Now, in the beginning of the third volume of Aristotle's Rhetoric, he says, now, when it comes to actually doing an effective presentation, that's a very curious thing to say. The man is, is admitting that the first two volumes that he wrote don't have to do with actually delivering an effective presentation, which I thought is what oratory is all about. Putting that aside, when it comes to actually delivering an effective presentation, there are three things which are most important. He does the first thing, the second thing, and then he says the third and most important. The third and most important. In the Greek, it's tain magistain dunamin. Dunamin is like the word dynamic. It's a power. It's a, like vermogen. Wichtigaste vermogen. Right? The third and most important thing you need for an effective presentation is So the greatest orator who ever lived, the man who looked back to the period of live culture, says hypocrisis is it. Aristotle, the man who founded the Western tradition of rhetoric, says hypocrisis is it. I don't know anyone who knows better. I don't know better. This is the secret. This is the most important thing. If you want to know what hypocrisis really means, it's very clear and it's very obvious. And what I do not understand is why nobody ever says the obvious truth about what hypocrisis means. Aristotle hints at it. Aristotle says, Aristotle only spends two paragraphs talking about hypocrisis. Right? Uh, and, but when he introduces it, he says, the, the third and most important thing is hypocrisis, and by hypocrisis I mean the sorts of things that actors in the Greek tragedies and poets who perform this poetry do. Then Aristotle gives you the equivalent of maybe two more paragraphs talking about it, and then he moves on to something else. So the most important thing 
Hupocresis gets two paragraphs in Aristotle's rhetoric, and the 99.99% of the rest of Aristotle's rhetoric is about what is not most important. Why doesn't Aristotle say more about it? He gives two excuses. One excuse is this. He says, I'm ignorant. I don't know what it is. You see, when Aristotle says he's ignorant, he doesn't say, I'm ignorant like that. What he says is he says like this, there hasn't been much research done on this subject. That means I don't know. Demosthenes was across town. All he had to do was go ask him. Or he could go ask the actors in the Greek tragedies. What do you do? Do the research, Aristotle. You're not going to do the research on what you admit is the most important thing? Why didn't he do the research? Well, he explains that too. He says, and, you know, this kind of thing involves manipulating people's feelings. So it's vulgar. Well, now we're done. It's all. I'll tell you exactly what hypocrisis means. Are you about ready to know? Yes. All right. Let me show you one word in Greek. Two words, actually. Hypocrites and hypocrisis. Can you see how close these words are to each other? They're almost identical, except the ending is different. We want to know what hypocrisis means. Well, what does hypocrites mean? Here's what it means. Hypocrites was the classical Greek word for actor. That, and it was a very specific kind of actor. The actors in Greek tragedy, they were called hypocrites. Hypocrisis is what the actors do. In English, we say actor and acting. It's the substantive. It's not action. It's not delivery. It's actor acting. The words are almost identical. It's the same word. It has never been translated as the same word in the history of rhetoric. Nobody has ever told the truth in the translation. But Aristotle knew that's what it was because he said what it was. He says, who will That's what the actors do. And Demosthenes studied with actors and took coaching from actors and rehearsed in front of a mirror. And you know what hypocrisis is. Even if you didn't know what the word was, even if you think you don't know what acting is, even if you couldn't answer the question what it is that actors do, and you know this by experience, haven't you all, at least once in your life, seen a film, either in the theater, or it could be on television, or been to a play, and really been moved by it. The curtain opens, or the credits start, you're sitting there in your seat, and suddenly something starts happening, and you get caught up. The people come out, and things happen to them. And it starts mattering to you what happens to them. It's like, oh, is they going to get hurt? Or is it something that's good that's going to happen? And you're sitting there, and you're caught up in it. You're following along, and you're relating to everything that's going on when it's good. And the story unfolds, and you come to the end. And the curtains close, or the credits start rolling again, and you're in your seat. Maybe if you're there with a friend, they start trying to ask you a question like, did you like it? And you just, no, I don't. You're in this state, and you don't want to leave it right away. And you're feeling something, and you're having a realization. Sometimes, on some occasions, it's even like your soul has been involved. But what took you there? was hypocrisis. I talked to a Swedish friend of mine whose name is Matt. And, uh, uh, Matt is about my age, but he looks 10 years older because he works really hard. He's always working hard. He's always either hustling after acting work or doing acting work. I admire him for it. And I, I, I tried to do what I thought Aristotle should have done. Go ask an actor. All right, just ask them. You know, what do you do, Matt? 
And, and I said to him, uh, Matt, you know, I've been doing this research. And Aristotle and Demosthenes, they both say that what you do is the key to effective speaking. So what do you do, Matt? <laughs> you know, when you're acting, you, you work more than anyone I know. What do you do? And he said, well, you know, when I get a part, I like to study the character and really prepare the role and all of that. And I said, yeah, but when you're actually doing it, when you walk out on stage or the camera starts turning, you're not preparing the role then, are you? He said, well, no, no. <laughs> okay. So I said, well, so when that happens, like when you're actually doing it, then what do you do? He said, well, uh, you know, I like to know what it is the director wants for this particular moment, and then I try. And I say, yeah, but when you're actually in it, you're not like talking with the director. He says, no, no, I'm not then. That's before. I said, okay. So then this goes on for 10 minutes, you know. So maybe Aristotle tried and he couldn't get a straight answer. I don't know. But, fun. but after 10 minutes, I did get an answer from Matt. I mean, I just kept coming back and coming back and coming back with the same question. Like the kid questioning Demosthenes, you know, what is it, what is it, what is it? And, and, and I guess like Demosthenes, finally, Matt looked at me and kind of, and I said to him, so uh, in that moment when you are doing it, what do you do as an actor? And he shrugged his shoulders and he said, well, I live something. Live something. That's what actors do. When you get caught up in that film or in that play, those people come out on stage, they're living it. What's the highest compliment people pay to an actor? You really live the part. When Demosthenes tells you that the most important thing to do for an effective presentation, first, second, last, one thousand is hypocrisis, what actors do. He's, he means live it. If you don't live it, all of the gestures and the changes in the voice and the movement, it's just artificial. It might contribute something, but it's not the highest form. And I don't believe that Demosthenes was telling this young man how to be a bad orator or how to be second rate. He was telling him what was the best. And the best is when you live what? Well, you're not living Hamlet, are you? No. You're not living Nesundorma. That's Pavarotti who lives that and spent his life learning how to live it so well. May he rest in peace. You're living. It's Tuesday afternoon, guys. Here's next week's work schedule. Now you can live that or not. If you live it, if you're alive, your message will come to life. And if you don't, it'll be dead. And will not be received as effectively. Guaranteed. And what do you do when you're alive? Well, you talk to people, don't you? So yes, in my workshops on presentation skills, we work on vocal skills to make the talking more effective. And you do gesture, you know, blind children gesture as much as children who can see when they're trying to express themselves. There are studies that show people think more clearly when they gesture. They don't know why, they don't know what the connection is between the motor activity and the cognitive activity. They just know there's a coincidence, they go together, that's testable. So in a good workshop on presentation skills and rhetoric, you work on gestures, on doing them more effectively. You work on movement in the room because when you're alive, you move around. These are all delivery skills. But that isn't all you do when you're alive. I mean, that's... You think. You feel. You have spiritual qualities. There are issues of right and wrong that come up. You have your passions. You have your guts. You have everything that can be human, which can be brought to bear on expressing yourself more effectively during a presentation. You have the whole universe of what is your humanity, what your life is. So learning to do more effective presentations is learning to be alive when you do the presentation. You all know how to be alive. It's just a question of applying that aliveness to a presentation and knowing that's where you go with it. Now actors will use different techniques to come to life. Some will use more their imagination, some will use their personal history, some will use imitation. There are a lot of different ways that they get there technically. Similarly, 
If you're working on becoming a, a more alive speaker, it may be gestures help you to be more alive. That may be your way in. It may be working on a vocal skill. It may be moving around. It might be what you can do with the PowerPoint. You find your own way, the key that's going to bring you in. But what I think can take you to the highest level of development of a speaker in a meaningful, historic way is knowing what the point of it all is. And the point of it is to live the message.